Today we come to the place where the battle was won. We may have thought that that was Calvary. You may have considered the sign of our victory to be the empty tomb. And yes, it was, but not first. The final battle was actually won in Gethsemane. What Bishop Hayes just read for us from Matthew's Gospel. This was the place, the victory of our peace came in Jesus' peace at his place of prayer. Because you see, it was at Gethsemane that Jesus drew the courage to face the cross. It was here that he surrendered his will. It was in Gethsemane that Jesus made the decision that he would rather go to hell for you than to be in heaven without you. Gethsemane literally means the place of crushing. And it was that place, the name coming from the olive press next to the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley, just less than two-tenths of a mile outside the eastern walls of Jerusalem. Some of you have been to the Holy Land. You know how very close it is across that valley. Luke twenty-two thirty-nine 39 reads that Jesus went out as usual to Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives. It was a favorite place. It was a very familiar place for Jesus, which is why Judas was so strategic to his enemies, because Judas knew this. Jesus had managed to slip through the crowds in the daylight, foiling any traps to, to catch him. But away from others at night, he'd be easier to get there. We can assume that Judas led them first to the upper room, knowing that's where he had left the, the group. But discovering them not there, he, maybe he thought, oh, yes, Gethsemane. That's where Jesus would be tonight. That's where he would want to go on a night like this. That's where we'll find him. So somewhere within the city walls, this 12th disciple darts through the street, one whose feet have just been washed by the one he will betray. Jesus and the other 11 have walked down roads lined with the torches and the fires and the tents of Passover pilgrims to a place called Gethsemane, Matthew records. And Jesus said to them, sit here for a while while I go over there and pray. He left, the, he left eight at the entrance. And then Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, were drawn into the interior of the garden and into the interior of Jesus' anguish. As he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with grief, with sorrow, to the point of death. Yes, we're hearing Jesus say, I would rather die than face this. Overwhelmed to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. There had been so many times that Jesus had sort of disappeared from the 12 and gone to his place of prayer. In the Galilean ministry, we'd go up to those hills around the Sea of Galilee just to there, there to be with his father. In the J Jerusalem ministry, it was here to the Mount of Olives. And they would watch and see him come back with so much resolve and certainty, so much clarity and, and, and newness. They could just sense and detect something was so different. They heard him reference a kind of praying that no one had ever heard, speaking to God as dead. Abba. What was this? So that they would ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gave them that little prayer of 60 to 70 words that you and I just prayed together a moment ago, but there was so much more that he had not actually taught them. He had, they had not actually seen. And so I can't help but wonder if maybe on this night, knowing it was his last night, he decided, you know, I think I will bring my three closest. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to let them see what I do when I by myself. And they stepped inside Gethsemane. Jesus' hidden place, Jesus' secret closet of prayer. I've had the most extraordinary, really the holiest experience of my life in the last six weeks as I was there under these 16 glorious days and nights of an outpouring of the presence of God at Asbury University. Maybe you kept up with it a little bit 
and you're on your phones and social media and things like that. It, it truly was the most ex um, amazing experience of my life as between 50 and 70,000 people crowded into this little town of 2,000. And we had Hughes Auditorium and Estes Chapel and McKenna Chapel and the Seminary Cafeteria and the Seminary Gymnasium and Great Commission Fellowship and Mount Freedom Baptist Church and the front lawn, 500 people on the lawn. And then a, waiting, a line waiting eight to 10 hours. And then the traffic backed up two miles to the point that Wilmore closed the city. There was literally not one single street, not one subdivision street that was not completely lined with cars. The IGA, the little grocery store, was empty of food. Subway, the one sub sandwich shop in the town, was completely empty of food. There was literally nothing left. It was completely packed to the absolute limit. So they had to close the city, close the little town. You had to show a Wilmore address on your ID in order to get in. I looked upon what I couldn't help but see as sort of like what it was like in the New Testament when the throngs of people just pressed in, longing for a touch from Jesus. That's what we were sort of living in. It's, I could go on and on about trying to describe this to you, what it was like to live under an open heaven. It was the only time in my life I can honestly say there seemed to be almost no delineation between earth and heaven. The presence of God was just so real, unmistakably real. And behind all that, you know, I found myself in those first few hours, I was there and just sort of landed in the lifeboat with six or eight university administrators and never left. We just sort of journeyed through that together every two or three hours, trying to meet, to, dis to discern what's happening in the room. How can we respond? How can we stay faithful to this? How can we just sort of steward that narrow ridge line of awakening, avoid the ditch of the excess on one side and the ditch of fear on the other, trying to just stay in that place where we could hold community under an outpouring, which God, by his grace, enabled us to do for those 16 days. We just held up while he poured out his love and power, especially upon Gen Z, upon these college students. We, had, we know documented students from 278 colleges and universities across America who at some point had a seat in Hughes Auditorium in those days. Little Hughes, little Wilmore. 35 campuses had some kind of expression of outpouring that just moved out. Here, we've had a worship gathering of worship leaders where we reached out to those campuses and those student worship leaders of those manifestations of, of worship that happened during those days on other campuses, came here and gathered here just these last few days here at your church. Thank you so much for hosting. A donor stepped up and said, if you can come, we'll pay your travel, your registration, your hotel. And 40 or 50 of those students came. It's been amazing. But underneath all of that, that little group that tried to steward this made a couple of decisions. We were no names. Nobody was coming to hear a celebrity. We always said every week, every day, there's no celebrity in the room. The only celebrity in the room is Jesus. And he's so much more than a celebrity to us. And we just made the decision there would be no sort of single person, uh, you know, no director, no, it was just, a, you know, different persons, a multiplicity. No one could detect who was actually trying to lead. And we made a decision that we would never introduce ourselves. We never introduced anyone. It was sort of a nameless leadership, no name but Jesus. And the worship continued it from February 8th when that first chapel began and didn't stop until midnight, February the 23rd. Those college students said, we will just continue to worship. Even when the room was empty, they had those worship bands playing, just ministering to Jesus, offering up their praises to him. And before any team would take this, uh, to come to the platform to lead, they would go to what they named the consecration room. This was a room upstairs behind Hughes Auditorium where these students would come for prayer and they would linger in prayer and they would examine themselves and seek to confront any sin. If they'd been looking at porn over the last week or if they had any relationship that was broken or anything at all that they needed to deal with and bring to the foot of the cross and they experienced the love of Jesus, just re refreshing them and redefining and re reestablishing their identity so that when they went up. It was kind of clunky at times, those worship teams. It wasn't the most polished, but it was the purest worship I think I've ever been a part of. And so when you have a nameless leadership and such a pure worship, it truly was a room in which Jesus held the spotlight. It was just nothing in the room but Jesus. That's the only way I can explain the sense of his presence that was so real, this joy that just flowed over these young men and women who needed his touch and needed his life so much, so much in the hidden places. I learned later how the development office, the advancement office at the, at the university, when it began to be clear that something was actually setting up and not going to stop, 
they immediately called off all their gift officers off the field, shut down the call center. All development events were canceled. They wouldn't, didn't want anyone to have any thought that they were trying to raise money off of the elevated attention that the university was receiving in the media. All sorts of these sorts of hidden dimensions. Uh, you, you know this. So much of the work of God happens in the secret places. This is what Jesus taught. He said, don't go out on the street corners and babble on like the pagans do, trying to get the attention of men and women. If they get that attention, I tell you, they just received all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go to your room and close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what is done, what is done in secret will reward you. The power, the God's power in unseen places. This has been the, the theme of the prayer conference that's gone on here over the weekend. And I just want to say, Woodlands Methodist Church, thank you so much for the priority you give to the life of prayer. It is just absolutely beautiful to see the, the way in which you center yourself in this way, that you would give a weekend just to grow and learn and deepen the life of prayer. It has been an, an extraordinary experience for me to be with you over these days. Such a beautiful thing. Because we know in the hidden place, this is where it actually got done in Gethsemane. This is where it began to settle. This is where the will of God became the will of the Son. And it, became, it began to unfold for our salvation. It was in the hidden place of prayer, the place of sacrifice. That's where the road takes us today. The place of sacrifice, the place of an agony in prayer. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, the hidden place. I was curious about this back in the fall of 2010. I was a part, it was, I was involved in a, in a project, a, a PhD project, uh, just really around the reality of desperation. Why is it, it seemed to me, that God seems so drawn to desperate moments, desperate people? What is it about the nature of God, the economy of God that seems to just come on so much around when people are literally at the end of the rope because it seems to me that that's more and more where we're finding ourselves. I, I don't know about you, but we're, we're living in such a desperate moment. Just ask any kid that goes to a public high school to tell them what they look at as they walk down the halls of their school. They'll tell you just how desperate it is. I was saying this to the prayer conference just this week about my own daughter who's a high school senior. And she's told me about the, just the levels of anxiety and depression and suffering that she looks at in the faces of her friends. And she was telling me about the furries, which I had no idea about. These students who, who come to school dressed as animals, they wear ears and tails and they respond with hisses and sounds and I said oh honey come on this is this is absurd no dad it's true and I got on and googled this and I said oh my I found these there are conferences of these students that come dressed like this in my own my parents hometown in Meade County Kentucky a little Meade County high school there was a chat the group of furries and I began to understand that this the pain felt by Gen Z is so bad. You know, it used to be that you heard about cutting. They would cut themselves to transfer the pain of their hearts to some other type of pain that would relieve in some ways the, the depth of pain they were suffering. But it's gone to a point now where it's almost like a living suicide. Like human experience is so intolerable that I just don't even want to be human. I will just be something else. I'll be, I'll come as something else. Rather than take my life, I'll just not even live a human life. This level of desperation that we are in, I don't know about you, I don't know how you assess the need, how you read the moment we're in, but to me, it feels like a five alarm fire. How much worse will it have to be before we just realize this is critical? To me, it seems like a push all the chips to the table, sell the farm, whatever it takes moment. This kind of moment, this kind of heart that we're in is one that we will never whiteboard our way out of. We will never 
come up with enough programs. If that were the case, it would have, we would have had something changed by now. If, if our best energies and ideas could turn the tide of the decay we're living under, it would have happened by now. We're the best resource Christians who have ever lived. And look where we find ourselves. We are just, our nose is up against the wall now of just recognizing human excellence is too small a thing. What we're actually desperate for is something only God can do. And we use the language of awakening for that. We need an awakening movement, which is our deep taproot as Methodist Christians. We were, we're the sons and daughters of an awakening movement. That's what happened in 18th century England. That's just, that's the legacy. That's the inheritance we live under, which is deep wholeness in people, the renewal of the church, the evangelization of a generation, and the transformation of society. And that's something that none of us can make happen. What we can do is we can re remove impediments to it. We can posture ourselves to receive it. And we can cry out to God for it. And in his mercy, he will come. And that, the curiosity I had around that is what led me into this postgrad study. And that took me to a very unlikely place, to the far northwest of Scotland, to a little town, the islands of Lewis and Harris, to a town called Barvis, where there was an outpouring of God's presence that went on from 19... 49 to 1952, which some historians believe was the last real awakening in the Western world. I'd read a book about it called Sounds from Heaven by Colin and Mary Peckham. And that book included in the back 23 eyewitness accounts of what it was like to live under this open heaven. And realizing, you know, this is what we need. Not just 16 days and nights of it like we saw in Wilmer. We need 16 years of it, and not just in one place, but in every place, all around the country, as far as the grace of God will go. So I just decided, you know what, I just want to go and see that. I took a little bit of my grant money and got a flight to Stornoway, Scotland, and drove those hours to Barbas. And by God's grace, I was able to meet 11 of those 23 still living in their 80s, who were there when, when this was unfolding. I sat for a week and just interviewed these men and women. As they, their tears just came right back. 70 years later, they told me stories about what it was like. It was interesting. I said, okay, what was it? Was it Duncan Campbell's preaching? He was the great kind of keynoter of, the, of that movement. And, or was it the music? I'd heard so much about how they sang the Psalms. Or was it certain models of ministry? Oh, yes, all of that was important, they said. But to a person... People, they, these older men and women would describe the experience of being awakened in the night when they were kids by the sound of their parents' voices crying, which was an unsettling sound to a young person. They said we would get up and we would walk out and look over into the, down the stairwell and we would see our parents lying on the floor, faces on the floor, sobbing, calling out the names of, of the young men who had gone off to World War II with the simple, pure faith of Barvis. Northwest Scotland, and it, it had been shredded to pieces by what they'd seen in the war, and they'd come back, and it was all gone, lost, bitter and confused. And they were saying, God, we have to have our sons back. You must restore them. They talked about being out in the yard playing and hearing the sounds of their grandfather shouting, not what they would expect to hear. And they heard it coming from the barn. They would go look through the cracks of the barn, and they saw their grandfathers on their knees, old men, with their arms upstretched, shouting, God, we know you are a covenant-making God, a covenant-keeping God. Today, we hold you to your covenant. We must have our sons back. They were the first to use this phrase. I'd never really heard of it or thought of it. They called it travailing prayer. Like Paul in Galatians 4.19, I travail as if in the pain of childbirth that Christ might be formed in you. This agonizing, desperate, longing, fervent, desiring kind of prayer that won't be silenced. And I can tell you all, ever since I looked into the eyes of those men and women who once saw what we are so desperate to see, I've become convinced that the hope, we actually, the hope we have begins in some people being willing to let their hearts be plowed up by the honest reality of what we're under to receive seeds of this gift of travail. 
the, the love of Jesus in Gethsemane, this desperate place of prayer. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. <clears throat> now, the, the idea that prayer is the precursor to the great work of God, that's not a new idea. I mean, we know that. Y'all are gonna pray next Saturday or whenever, Holy Saturday, the day before Easter, probably two weeks from yesterday because you want to pray over all the ministry of the church. We know that everything ultimately finds its root there, but you know, I've wondered if, if this manner of prayer has somehow been kind of lost on us, sort of faded from us. It was the voice of prayer for 250 years from colonial America to the 1800s. This is the way the church prayed under the Great Awakenings. But I don't know, has it just faded? Have we just sort of forgotten it? Not in Latin America and in Asia and in Africa where we see the Christian movement at the vanguard of societal change and life transformation. For them, the prayer of tears is the native language of prayer. But for us, but this was the prayer of the Hebrews groan, who groaned in their slavery and cried out, Exodus 2 says, and God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant. This was the prayer of Hannah for a baby, overcome to the point of being thought intoxicated. They thought she was drunk, the priests did, the way she was praying. Oh no, 1 Samuel 1, 15, I've not been drinking wine or beer. I am pouring out my soul to the Lord. When he heard the news of Jerusalem's brokenness, Nehemiah sat down and wept and then fasted and prayed for days. This was the prayer of the prophets, that we give God no rest, Isaiah 62, that we cling to God like a belt clings to a person's waist, Jeremiah 13, that we go speedily before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 8. Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bent down and put his face between his knees, these beautiful little details in the Old Testament, not sitting down, but squatting down with his face between his knees. And scholars have studied that to determine that that was the posture of a woman in childbirth in those ancient times. Elijah knew the posture he was taking, that desperate, agonizing posture of prayer. This is the praying of the Psalms. Streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. Day and night I cry out to you, Psalm 88, one. Turn your ear to my cry. You see, we know from Gethsemane. We know in our own desperate moments that tears are liquid words. The Father hears tears. This was the prayer of Jesus who offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him, Hebrews 5, 7. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. I'm challenged to think, when was the last time that just driving around New Circle Road in Lexington, I just wept over Lexington, that the city would know the Lord. He blessed those with spiritual hunger and thirst. He taught those who followed him to keep on asking and seeking and knocking. He told parables to illustrate how his disciples should keep on praying and not give up. He healed 10 with lepers who called out in a loud voice. Just trace the miracle stories of the Gospels and see how every, almost every one of them are preceded by someone's desperate cry for help. Jesus, pass by me. Come look, for me. look at me, help me. Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, Luke 9. Two blind men who called out for Jesus' help and they were rebuked by the disciples in Matthew's gospel, so they just shouted all the louder. And when, then there is no deeper view into the heart of Jesus than what we just read, Matthew 26, then Gethsemane, where it was the agony of prayer that drew the first blood of the atonement. This is the praying of the early church, cleaving to one another in expectancy before Pentecost, earnestly praying to God for Peter in prison. This was the prayer of Paul who implored the Romans by the love of the Spirit, Romans 15, 30, to join me in my struggle, literally agonize with me by praying to God for me. He commended Epaphras to the Colossians as always wrestling in prayer for you. This is the praying of the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us through wordless groans. And in the Revelation, the only recorded prayer we have of the Holy Spirit is the urgent cry, come, which when united with the church beckons Jesus thrice repeated promise I come quickly y'all here's the truth the Bible seems utterly 
unfamiliar with casual prayer. Prayer of the mouth and not the heart. This kind of praying, this kind of burdened, focused pressing seems closer to the heart of prayer in Scripture. John Wesley was so amazed at the prayer life of the Moravians. You know, these were the people who actually led him to faith, led him to the new birth. Within a few months of that, he was going to Germany to go see who they were and what they were like. And he was just undone by the way they prayed. It moved him and shaped him so much so that when he returned, New Year's Eve, 1738, he was gathered with George Whitfield and Charles' his brother and 60 friends in the Fetter Lane Society. And they, he writes this about what has been called the, the Methodist Pentecost. About three in the morning as we were continuing, instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us in so much as that many cried out and many fell to the ground. And as soon as we were recovered a little from that awe and amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Later on, Wesley writes, I called on one who was sorrowing as without hope for her son who had turned again to folly. I advised her to wrestle with God for his soul. Wrestle with God for his soul. And in two days, he brought home the wandering sheep fully convinced of the folly of his ways. Wrestling, like Jacob wrestling for the, ble for the blessing, was a favorite image of Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney, the two leaders of the First and Second Great Awakenings. They believed it was not irreverent to be obstinate, to grapple, to take up the blessed struggle of prayer. That's what Edwards called it. Both of them understood how the Spirit could, could, could brood over a church, could hover over a community, conceiving new life as he did over chaos in creation. But it was then the church's role to pray that new life into reality. That's why they called the church the mother of the converted. And that praying could sound like a woman in labor. These were intercessors who had been seized by the raw facts of our need for God. Duncan Campbell, the leader of the Hebridean Revival, used to preach this. Let this I'm quoting him. Let us be honest in the presence of God and get right into the grips of reality. Have I a vision of our desperate need? Oh, for a baptism of honesty, for a gripping sincerity that will move us. The awakenings brim over with stories of petitioners for whom this honesty produced an agony in prayer, weeping and daring and unrelenting and insistent. They write of sweat and heaving and fasting. Finney emphasized praying to the point of praying through this phrase that, that sort of was of this witness that, you know what, I have this sense that God has done it. Somehow I feel like it's done in heaven, and now we'll just wait and watch for it on earth. It seems almost inappropriate to keep asking. I have the sense that he's heard us. So I'm going to begin now to, to thank him. Don't be anxious about anything, but through, in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And it's in that thanking and that where faith is operating. We believe it's coming, God. We have a sense that you're, were, you're hearing us. But most important to all of awakening history is that none of this courage and audacity, none of this Gethsemane heart, none of this determination in prayer could be manufactured. You just can't do that. You can't muscle your way into this. It's not self-generated. This was and is the ministry of the Holy Spirit operating as the spirit of prayer. Here was to them the key spiritual gift, the gift of God for awakening. God himself, by his spirit, providing the discernment, the faith, the language, the energy, the very breath and groan for the seeds of awakening. That, y'all, is how Travailing prayer could surge up like a spiritual geyser of overflowing holy love for this world Jesus died to save. That really is what travailing prayer is. Gethsemane love. Charles Finney once said this. Sometimes the conduct of the wicked drives Christians to prayer. He wrote, it breaks them. It makes them sorrowful and tenderhearted so that they can weep day and night. And instead of scolding the wicked, 
they pray earnestly for them, then you may expect a revival. He said, indeed, it has begun already. Then Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane. You know, I don't know anybody who doesn't deep down know that they should be praying more, be praying better. And you know, we're not talking about travailing prayer this morning to give anybody a guilt trip. Not here to try to make anybody feel badly about your life of prayer. I mean, any prayer is better than no prayer. And I've found that guilt is a very shallow and short-lived incentive for prayer. But I am wondering if there is anyone here today who is yearning for a better day who would be willing to offer God an openness to becoming less casual in how we pray for it. You know, some people believe that awakening, actual change is beyond the pale. It's beyond what we can hope for, that it's just impossible, it's implausible today. And I understand that. It can seem that way. But you know, every context of awakening has seemed entirely impossible. It was so unlikely in Wilmore that we would experience this outpouring. The the gospel languished under the church's corruption for nearly a thousand years before the Reformation. Those in the past who had the same desire for God's deliverance as we do believe that this manner of prayer would cause us to prize the gift of God and to, to love the giver all the more. The delay and persevering would purify and humble the church and make us ready to receive. Not turning prayer into a work. Not in any way earning God's favor with more volume or drama in our prayers, but being willing to be more experimental in our prayers, being willing to be less inhibited, more united in in the true ecumenical spirit that Wesley advocated, less worried about what anybody thinks. I I do wonder, what else will it take for us to move toward this kind of heart cry, which is so true to our nature, true to the roots, true to the legacy we live under? I wonder if there's anybody here today who'd be willing to regain an awakening sensibility, to, be, to just be caught in that grip of honesty that Campbell spoke of, a kind of heartache that we can't shake and we just pray it out. Anyone here willing to take on a knee-bending sympathy with God? That's the way that Finney spoke of it. That somehow our hearts have just become so connected to God's heart. This is when it happens. When God authors his, his heart, his, his prayers in us, and we give them utterance, We add faith to it and we unite around it. Then we watch God go to work. For Finney, the the prayer meeting was the crucial meeting. He would say, you know, I don't know if it it doesn't matter to me really uh, whether or not you can bring an unbelieving person to the preaching meeting, but don't come to the prayer meeting without someone who doesn't know Jesus. Because if they can come in and see the Christians praying and hear that longing and that agonizing love, he said, they'll get a picture of how God feels about them. In the awakenings, prayer was evidence of the love of God. Anyone here willing to let God give you a share of that holy love for his world? Voice not just in pulpits and blogs and books and tweets and newsletters or workshops, but in closets. Knowing that, you know, even with this, there's no, prayer is no guarantee. It's no formula. Charles Finney, I'll close with this story. Charles Finney was the great voice of the second great awakening and it was, it, was the, the, it was typical in that time um, to preach at Oberlin College. He preached. He was the president there. He was, lived there. He's buried there. Oberlin College, this school that was really carved out of the wilderness, the largest brick building on the frontier, 1100, still there. I've been there. It was typical in those days to preach in the morning, have lunch, and then come back in the afternoon and preach more, finish. There was one Sunday that Finney was preaching, packed house. He was preaching on the family. And on that Sunday, he came in, came to the pulpit, preached that morning on the family. They stopped, went away for lunch. He came back in the afternoon. He returned to the pulpit. He was very somber. Eyewitnesses have described this. He was very somber, and the crowd was, you know, began to settle, and he said, I cannot preach this afternoon. I cannot continue to preach on the family, knowing that not one of my six kids professes faith in Jesus today. And with that, eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses say that he knelt down behind the pulpit 
and began to travail over those six kids. Unconcerned for what anyone would think, completely disregarding. Who cares? I mean, what really, what would you care if your child is desperate? What would you do? Who would care about the opinion of anybody? He just opened up his heart and began to sob their names. And the whole room began to just join him, began to cry out for those six kids. It became like a labor and delivery ward, just calling out until finally Finney stood back up, wiped his face, walked out of the room. Every one of those six kids came to faith, but not in Finney's lifetime. He didn't see it. And I'm wondering if there's anybody here today who would just say, you know, my, the way I see things, I'm going to step into the ring of that blessed struggle and I'm going to die there. And I don't even have to see it. I hope my kids will see it. I hope my grandchildren will live under it. I don't have to see it. But I know this, so long as there's breath in my lungs, God's going to hear about my kids, my grandchildren. He's going to hear about my church, my community. I'm going to step into the, the place of Gethsemane love and I'll stay there. You see, travailing prayer is nothing more than prayer with integrity. I always ask people, so how do you assess the moment? What do you think? How do you think things are? And how much does it matter to you? And if you see it and agree that it is desperate, how do we pray about it casually? Travailing prayer is just prayer with integrity. It's prayer that's pro proportionate to, commensurate with the level of the need. We pray desperately because we have desperate need of God. I'm just wondering who here this morning would be willing to say, you know, that's, I, count me in. That's what I need. I know that's what we need. That's where I need to go. I will just tell you all six years of research and that thing and everything that I've, I've just come to believe all that we hope for. We're not going to see it until more of us step into this. Nothing happens until this happens. Would all of us be willing to give up less easily in prayer, to take more risks in prayer, to become bold and tenacious again? That may involve healing of some past disappointments in prayer. I know how that is. Maybe that's the great need. God, would you just heal my hurt over prayer that just never got answered? Would you put me back to my knees again? I can try to trust you once more. Whatever it is, whatever it might summon from anyone's heart who yearns for a better day, would there be anyone here who would be willing to follow Jesus into Gethsemane and not sleep there, but actually say, yes, you can count on my prayers, Jesus. I will join you. I will go to the place where it all began, where it actually got worked out. I'll meet you there. Travailing prayer is not the only thing we do, but it is the first thing, and it is the most important thing. Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane. You people who are now crying are blessed, Jesus promised in Luke 6, because you will laugh with joy. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs and joy. That is God's promise to the prayers of Gethsemane. And he is too worthy. Awakening would be too beautiful. And the need is too great to settle for anything less. So this morning, as we get closer to Holy Week, I'm just going to invite you all. I don't know if it's, you know, kind of your habit, pattern, but I want to invite you, anyone who will, is to meet me at the altar today, is to say, yes, Jesus, I need you. I'm here to cry out for the one I love. And yes, Jesus, you can count me in. I want to grow in prayer. I'm not the best, I, but I want to grow in prayer. I want more in prayer. I want it. I'm asking for it. I want to invite you to meet me there today. Let's bow our hearts together as we close. Father, we offer to you ourselves, we offer our hearts, our prayers, these closing moments. And I ask you, Lord, to pour out your love into our, lo our hearts and give us prayer. Help us to move towards you. And Lord, we want to pray better. We want to pray more because you, you, you really are the one calling us. This is what we see in you. and We love you and we 
desire to be there with you and we want to see what you can do. And, and so I ask you, Lord, to just deepen and strengthen us on our knees. We trust you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.